Hi, this is Paul, and a whole bunch of stuff to talk about, really. A lot of it flowing from my conversation with Brendan Graham Dempsey. And as many of you noted, that was, hmm, I think it was a really good conversation. And we've got another one scheduled for pretty soon. And uh, if you saw all the way to the end of the conversation, you probably saw a little bit about why, how I said, well, this was sort of in reverse. And it was in reverse for reasons. And I think in a lot of ways, the conversation typified why I approach most relationships, not conversations. I noticed I said relationships, not conversations. Why I approach relationships, online relationships differently, and actually what that has to do with, oh, this little corner. If you go back to the Friday live stream, now I clipped a couple little pieces. I clipped three little portions of this Friday live stream, partly because just the way YouTube works, people don't know what's in a big video unless you sort of highlight it with its own title and then they'll get a sense. And if you do a title and a thumbnail, people will get a better sense. But there were two parts of, parts of this conversation where I talked about the Jordan Peterson Destiny Con. There are three portions. Of course, there was Grim Grizz's. I did a little background info. I at, least, I at least looked at Wikipedia and I didn't find what Grim Grizz was pointing to. So Grizz, if you wanna, you can you can DM me and Twitter um, any any kind of uh, evidence for your your claims with respect to Vouch and Destiny because I, I really am a little curious. But my conversation with Sandy was very interesting. And even though I didn't clip it, I didn't clip it because I didn't think most people would understand my conversation with Sandy without a lot of explanation. My conversation with Sandy, I think, had a lot to do with trauma. Now, part of the reason why I approach conversations like I do is because there's a lot of trauma out there in the world and there's a certain amount of religious trauma. Now, religious trauma is, in my experience, a very interesting thing. I, I was thinking about doing a video just on religious trauma. This may become that video. I don't know if I can not touch on it. Regil religious trauma is a particular sort of trauma, I think, and it, it's a trauma that has to do often with a combination of worldview and family forces. And if, if there are two strong powers in this world, those are, those are two very strong powers in this world, worldview and family forces. When Jordan Hall, for example, became a Christian, especially in the first video that John made with him offering I and um, lay out my heart and my mind articulate where I'm John was John is always very careful and I noticed that when I first started talking with John he's a very careful um, he's a very generous but he's a very cautious conversation partner and he's and he's careful about his conversation partner's feelings, and and I often I will I will try to get him to be a little less careful, because part of what happens with trust is rough and tumble play. Now Rafe Kelly, I don't remember if it was conversation with Peugeot or or Verveke, but but. John or Rafe Kelly was talking about game with his kids, such as the the slap game, and so his kids his kids would slap him, and he would slap them back. and And the importance of that game is to sort of within the bounds of the relationship between parent and child, get a sense for where the boundaries are with respect to rough and tumble play. Because the truth is, if everything is always just sort of regulated and nice, this is sort of the the tragedy of the the whole um, <laughs> the whole regime of overt verbal consent at each aspect of progressive intimacy, physical intimacy between two people. Yeah, you can do that and you can make an argument for it, but it sort of takes the fun out of it. 
um, people when they are flirting. So, and, and this this goes to let's say weddings. My um, my son and future daughter in law were filling out some things for the DJ, and they came to a question about the wedding cake. And and the question basically around the wedding cake was, are you going to play with your food? Meaning. There's a tradition in weddings where someone takes the wedding cake and puts it on their puts it on their bride or the groom's face. And, and you have a little food fight right there in the ceremony. That food fight is really important because generally speaking, if you throw food at someone and th these these sorts of engagements are both exploration and tells with respect to, well, what is the status of our relationship? And that can get really tricky. Teasing is an element of that. And of course, culturally, both by virtue of my Dutch culture and my New York culture, East Coast, New, Jer New York, New Jersey culture, teasing is a big part of, of let's say, bonding. Because in, in certain cultures, you can sort of tease someone, British, they're called taking the piss out of someone. You can do it in a playful way or you can do it in a, a difficult way and it's always sort of a boundary issue as to whether or not okay is this is this play and so you do it back and forth and so in in my conversation with with Brendan Graham Dempsey you know we had a couple little interchanges first where it's like okay well because we hadn't talked with each other and part of the reason that I almost always begin with my style of Rando's conversations when I'm beginning a relationship with a person is I want to be able to at least begin to guess where the landmines were. And if we sort of start right into a topic like metamodernism and Christianity, I don't know where that person's landmines are. I don't know where that person's soft points are. I don't know where that person's, uh, how much trauma this person is carrying with respect to these questions. And so you proceed well, tenderly, unless someone sort of dives into a point, and then it's like, oh, okay, is this the way we're going to play? So then we dive in together. And, and I thought on the whole that the conversation, the conversation went well. But it was interesting in the light of the conversation about Jordan Peterson and Destiny that I had another conversation that was generally more contentious than many of my conversations are. Now, this having a persona and let's say creating a persona or profilicity, creating an online identity, I, I, I tend to have a an identity as being a, a persona, profilicity as being a very nice guy. And, and that often that often gets into what some people would think of as soft. And so Grim Grizz's comment early on in my audience questions and answers for March 22, Grim Grizz puts in a comment, we're thinking PVK is too soft to host this kind of nature. Well, that's because, well, he thinks that, well, I'm just kind of a nice guy and so I'll let people talk too long. And often I will. But there's actually a reason for that. And so then when I do a conversation which is a little less contentious or a little more contentious as with this conversation, then sudden peop suddenly people are a little bit, well, like they get a little nervous. Because again, this is part of what happens with trauma. That, and, and it's not just trauma, it's also sort of people's senses of what's safe. Now, because I hadn't sort of had a an understanding of, of Brendan's story, I had to sort of cold read him and make certain assumptions. And then you look for signs along the way. And my sense with him was we could we could play rough a little bit. That was that was my sense. And and hopefully my sense was right. You never really know because afterwards people will look back on it and maybe they'll feel like I was uh, too aggressive or and and then you'll get the comments comment section is so fascinating because as is almost always true 
those of you who leave, leave comments, comments usually say way more about you than they do about me or even the conversation that you're, that you're making. That isn't to say that comments are worthless or bad or that there aren't really, really many great comments. I want to, in fact, highlight a great comment in this. But often you'll get comments, oh, maybe we can, and, and, and even the, the comments on his, the, this, this conversation on his channel were even more interesting to me because, of course, those who populate my comment section tend to be people who watch more of my videos. On his channel, my channel's a little bit bigger, so on his channel, I get get to see how some of his audience impacted it, and and you'll get a you'll get a spectrum of you'll get a spectrum of comments. Some of which will be, well, Paul was a bully. Oh, okay, they won't it won't say bully, but that's sort of it. That Paul Paul played too rough, and so then they're sort of defensive for Brendan for Brendan. And on my channel, sometimes I'll get comments that sort of go the other way that. Um, so and so played too rough, and, and so someone's going to jump to my defense, and that's 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 pretty normal. So part of what's really important about the John Verveke um, Jordan Hall conversations is these two have developed a deep well of trust, and so initially, especially in the first. The first part of their conversation, John, and, and John's talked about the trauma that he experienced at the hands of religion, I'll say it that way, in the home that he grew up in. And, and again, this is something that bears a whole lot more explanation. And so very quickly, when Jordan not only becomes a Christian, but becomes a kind of Christian that says things that violate the creeds of naturalism. Naturalism is another video I want to make a, another topic I want to make a, do some more video work on because it's important. A Christianity that violates and isn't afraid to violate some of the tenets of naturalism. John, John was concerned and that, that sort of came on the heels of John talking about Hermes and that sort of ran through at least the Christian end of John's audience. And so John had good reason to be a bit nervous about a whole bunch of things. And, and one of his, his big concerns was, which he wanted to explore with Jordan and explore publicly with Jordan, because their relationship in private and their relationship in public, while connected, are, is not necessarily the, the same. You do a performative thing in public that you don't necessarily do in private, but they're both related. And so these conversations between these two are actually vitally important, not just in terms of the relationship between John and Jordan, but also the, the sense of a lot of people who, by virtue of the meaning crisis, are sort of back in religion-y spaces trying to figure out who they can trust. Because trauma is all about who or what you can trust. You know, once bitten, twice shy is a great example because dogs are actually a really fine illustration of some of these dynamics. Because dogs, when you walk up to a dog, it's there are signs as to, you know, whether or not you're going to get bit. But the signs aren't always completely clear because a lot of dog behavior is is can sort of be read two ways for exactly for example tail wagging tail wagging really expresses um it, it expresses intensity and excitement but that excitement in any particular dog might lead to you know really enjoyable greeting like we're trying to treat teach my dog to a to greet more appropriately, especially with people like older people and people have disability issues because uh, a 60 pound dog, if the dog is too excited, can knock someone over and that's a problem. The dog doesn't, there's no malice in it. The dog's not being aggressive or trying to attack the person. The dog just doesn't know how to arrange their own excitement. Some dogs, before they bite, do, in fact, wag their tails. Uh, the, the, the most common understanding of a dog that's getting aggressive is, of course, snarling and growling, and most people sort of understand that. 
But there, there are many people who don't like dogs or are afraid of dogs and have trouble reading dogs. And so they're, they're a little scared about dogs. And in fact, that might, might go back to some childhood trauma. Part of the difficulty here is the definition of religion. Now, there's a, there's a good video out on trigonometry with Alex O'Connor talking to the trigonometry guys. And I haven't finished listening to him. I've, I've, I've only gotten this far in it, about halfway through. But the, the first part of the conversation, which I was a little less interested in, which had to do with sort of, well, is concerns about AI a religion in the same way that some might see wokeism or uh, extremism around climate change a religion? And what they actually do early on is they, is they do some, I think, good example work of exploring this question, which is extremely difficult in the contemporary period. Now, I was watching a little bit of Father Eric talk about the ambiguity, the temporal ambiguity versus other ambiguities on the word modern. But this, this question about what exactly is a religion is, is obviously a very difficult one. But it's one, that we have to, it's one that we have to deal with. Now, for many people, I think, John, I think now once I get into um, Brendan's story a little bit more, we'll find out a little bit more. But especially with John's story, and John's been fairly, fairly upfront with his story, some of his trauma had to do with you go into a different worldview and you lose your family, or you lose the kind of close relationship you once had with your family. Families are tricky things because on one hand, there are many different bonds that that develop within a family. There are emotional bonds, there are psychological bonds, there's a deep imprinting. We inherit from our parents our first draft map of the world. And when someone in that family adopts a different, at some point adopts a different, sometimes a radically different mapping of the world, the tensions within the family are stressed. And in fact, right now in our culture, there's there's an ongoing debate about how to deal with these kinds of tensions because we don't exactly know. For example, if someone in your family, let's say you have a Muslim family, and decides they're not, they don't want to be a Muslim anymore, they want to be a Christian or they want to be an atheist or something like this, what does your family do? How about if you're a Christian? How about if, and how about if you're Jewish? How about if, and on and on and on and on. Because these, these, the communal aspect of all of us sort of sharing this map together, which is what families do so well, is part of the security and the trust within families. And when significant divisions happen, let's say over a transformation with respect to someone's map and religion, well, that adds stress. And then you have questions well, what do you do with that? Or should they be shunned? And of course, shunning is, is, some, is some of what some religious traditions have done. Um, there's, uh, there are traditions in Islam of even of more violent responses to people's breaking from the communal map. And these things happen at large levels and they happen at small levels, but they're important. And then sometimes when people within the family, let's say someone decides to leave a particular religion, and then the family says, oh, no big deal. Well, now suddenly their mapping has changed as well. In other words, there's no easy way out of these dilemmas. And that's what makes conversation about religion so difficult. And it makes conversation about religion so difficult, especially when we don't know each other very well, especially when most of what we know are on these one hour or two hour or three hour conversations. We don't really know each other very well at all. It's, that's sort of the, the, 
a delusionary aspect of YouTube. We sort of feel like we know them, but again, we just know their profilicity. We, know, we just know who they are, just as, for example, Paul is a super nice guy. Paul can be a super nice guy. Paul has some other edges to him. And every now and then, in some videos, you'll see some of these other edges. And then suddenly, you have to fill out some other portions of your mapping of who Paul Vanderclay is. Now, I thought this comment left on the video on my channel was extremely perceptive at a variety of levels. Paul, I think the fact that this conversation sort of functions at the beginning just as a back and forth of speeches until Brendan realizes that you actually believe in the resurrection. This was sort of this crying games moment that uh, Jonathan Peugeot had with rationality rules that was so dramatic in their video. And then you are able to begin to actually make some more direct claims that show that there's a disconnect between different people's ideas of what the corner is. I think he's exactly right. The civility and openness that the conversation was framed with initially did not facilitate the real dialogos, in his opinion. I think he's right. And I think that's part of the... I, I think it's fair to say, if we sort of understand what John Verveke means by dialogos, Brendan and I really didn't, really didn't succeed in attaining to dialogos in that conversation. And I think my reason for that is, again, the reason why I proceed with conversations, which I always try to see conversations in the context of a relationship, which is why I always start the way I start with my conversations, with a significant amount of biography, just so that I, because often people have seen a fair amount of me, but so, so that I can see a little bit of them. So then maybe we can find some common footing to sort of begin, and then perhaps dialogos can happen. For me, civility does not define this little corner. That was kind of the abortive principle between the IDW and those little counter-narrative movements that began to emerge post-2016. It seems to me like you felt you had to equivocate on aspects of your Christianity in order to get the conversation started. I don't know if I had to equivocate It's just that the topic of the conversation was metamodern Christianity. And I really do believe that my Christianity has become metamodern. But there's not one metamodern Christianity. It's sort of like if we imagine metamodern to be the other side of a frontier. Let's say the frontier is the Mississippi. Okay, on the other side of the Mississippi. But on the other side of the Mississippi, this gets down to Peugeotian language. On the other side of the Mississippi is not one place. On the other side of the Mississippi is a continent. And so metamodernity really is a sort of getting past certain aspects, but many of us are coming to it in different ways. And this is part of the reason that the corner has corners and that the John Verveke corner and the PVK corner and the Jonathan Peugeot corner and the how many other different little sub-corners, let's say the, the Father Eric corner, sub-corner, that, that these map, these lead to very different, lead to very different places. And, and one of the main issues, I think, in metamodernity is having to deal with, well, how exactly do you deal with the fact that modernity is receding? And what came clear in the conversation is that Brandon and I have very different approaches to this. Even though we both grew up in conservative Christian households, I continue to maintain myself in a conservative Christian household. I continue to maintain some anti-naturalist or some non-naturalist beliefs. But what I really couldn't get at in that video was how I think about either holding or not holding non-naturalistic beliefs. I wanted to get at that a little bit, but we, we really didn't have enough time or enough specificity to actually go into some of those questions. Uh, that question of 
that question of how to deal with non-naturalist beliefs everyone. actually comes up in this conversation with, with John Verveke and Jordan Hall. This little section was actually quite important. Um, so so that, that brings up something interesting. Um, so there's a sense in which there are dimensions of reality that will be disclosed in this whole self towards whole of reality that cannot properly be grasped by the scientific worldview, but are ultimately must be presupposed by it. Because I would put it to you that the relationality to disclose but by the whole self to the whole of reality is precisely the, you know, the ground of intelligibility itself. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the very possibility of connectedness, the very possibility of there being something other than a random scattering of nothingness or something. I don't know what to say. Even particles will have some sort of logos to them. Right. Uh, but I, I, you know what I'm trying to get at. I, and now the thing for me is I still find this deeply consistent with what you might call the boundaries of the scientific worldview. I think if you deep if when you dig down into the quantum, you hit pure relationality, and if you, if you, if you sort of build up to the relativistic, you hit pure relationality as what is being emphasized as the grounding of reality. And so th this this comes this is where there might be a difference between us, but I'd like to explore it. Um, I understand the supernatural as the proposal that that which is disclosed beyond the scientific worldview is in important ways inconsistent with it, is other than it, works according to different uh, oh. principle than it. And what John and Jordan immediately understood that there too. And I know, I don't know if John ever finished, I know he purchased and read a little bit of C.S. Lewis's book on miracles. C.S. Lewis directly addresses this question a number of times in the book, miracles, that the scientific is not threatened by that which is beyond the scientific. Now, as I've said many times here, I think the framing of natural and supernatural, C.S. Lewis uses that in his book, but I think the framing of natural and supernatural is not a particularly good framing. I think a better conversation is getting at the question of the continued decline of naturalism as a social force. It's still a potent social force, but in terms of, I'd say, worldwide culture, it is declining. Now, now John pretty regularly uh, colonizes me and tempts me to buy books. And we talked about the mind of the whitehead, um, who, you know, and I, you know, was tempted to sort of go look at that and pull the trigger on that. Now, Carlos Erie is. Beyond Tom Holland, who really isn't a functional part of the corner, um, we don't have a lot of historians or a lot of viewing of history, but Carlos Erie's They Flew just recently came out, and I'm really enjoying it. This is Carlos Erie's book that Kales uh, Eldon and I usually talk over, and I bought this copy for the church because I figured some of my catechumens might enjoy reading it. It's probably not going to happen. But for me, this was one of the best books I read on the Protestant Reformation, one of the fairest books. Now, I haven't done any digging into Carlos Erie. I, I, I suspect he's a Roman Catholic, but he's, he's a, he's a top-notch historian and he's not afraid to deal with difficult issues, such as, in this case, questions revolving, well, just they flew, a history of the impossible. And we'll see whether or not I finally do do a video on naturalism. I, I can't keep this on my, we'll just put it here. I find naturalism implausible. I've said that many times. And I find, just as people find Christians to reliably be hypocrites, in other words, they can't fully embody their aspirational beliefs or standards, 
I find naturalists to be that way all the time. I've made a variety of videos about that over the years. One of them was the story that Jordan Peterson tells on a podcast. I don't remember the name of the podcast anymore, but he tells the story of himself and one of his grad students going to a conference, and they were sharing a hotel room, and the hotel room was haunted. And there were a whole variety of manifestations that happened in this hotel room. And there was clearly no reasonable, logical way to explain the, the small but really odd manifestations that happened in this hotel room. And as it turns out, that was early in my time here, and, and one of Jordan's, this person that Jordan had traveled with, um, I was talking to me about Jordan's work, and I was talking to him, and what and so and he sort of expressed himself as much more of a of a naturalist and so i asked him about this and he basically said strange things happen this is exactly the same thing at the beginning of cs lewis books book miracles where he makes the comment which i've made numerous times on this channel that cs lewis observed that the only person that he knew that claimed ever have to have seen a ghost didn't believe ghosts existed. Now, this is why I bring up After School just recently did what I thought was quite a good video on the fact that it's often highly intelligent, high status individuals that are the most captured by their biases. And if there's a bias that has held high status academia, not necessarily politics, but high status academia for a very long time, it has been naturalism. And, you know, there are numerous books that show that, truth be told, after naturalism, people, people believe, just look at the world work of Clay Rutledge. Um, people believe all sorts of things. And this is part of the recession, I would say, of naturalism as a potent force in our society. But yet people are regularly surprised, and part of that's what happened in this conversation. Well, Paul believes that Jesus showed up in a room and Thomas touched his hand and his side. Let's get back to this comment. It seems like you, like you felt... It seems like you felt you had to equivocate on aspects of your Christianity in order to get the conversation started. So maybe the reasons for this conversation to begin were too general, and there needs to be a different reasons to have a conversation now than just, we're just to talk to Verveke and some others. And I think he's exactly right on that point. And this is part of the reason. I know I regularly get, I very regularly get suggestions and recommend, recommendations and sometimes pleading to talk to this person or that person or this person or that person. And for the most part, I don't do it. And the reason I don't do it is exactly this. Because YouTube is full of conversations with high-status people that everybody wants to talk to for a New York Minute or maybe a longer. And I don't often see the point to it. And I also see the fact that Almost everybody, when they have these conversations, asks the same questions that everybody else does. And so if I'm really, if I have other questions, maybe I'll go out and ask them, or maybe I'm just fanboying in a case or two. But for the most part, you don't need to, because the relation, I think Dialogos, the, Dialogos is dependent on a relationship that has a fair, that has a high degree of trust. Therefore, people who have had trauma in their past can open themselves up. Because I think actually Vervakian Dialogos is about, it's reciprocal opening. It's about two people opening themselves up to each other. And trauma is actually the opposite of that. Now I know trauma is, trauma is the new self-esteem 
my wife and I were looking at a house the other day, and uh, it was on self-esteem lane. And then we went back into the house, and there was a really nice ADU on the house. It was very, very obvious that that AD that the house was owned by a therapist, and the therapist was probably the first person to develop that little road a little ways out into the country. And he got to name the road self-esteem lane. And I thought, oh boy, if I lived on self-esteem lane, that would be something. Anyway, I, I know you like talking to everyone and you probably enjoyed this conversation, but I hope you get some uh, some of what I say. No, I very much understand what you say, Alexander. I very much understand what you say. And in that, I think there's a sense that in talking, there's hope for relationships. And so this little corner likes to talk and many people like to listen. But I think Alexander is exactly right that it's not just conversation. It's conversation in a direction. And I think for, for those of us who are Christians, it's conversation in an evangelistic direction, but not in the kind of facile, mercenary, instrumental way. Well, what's been really interesting, again, about Jordan Hall's journey is that Jordan is, like me, now quite open about his evangelistic enterprise, even though he understands, as I understand, that, well, it's, it's also not incidental that he's sort of cozied up to a group of Calvinists. Because one of the things about then I'm going to make some other videos about instrumentalism because a bunch of these perennial issues within Christianity have come up. And what's really nice at the end of this video, yeah, he talks about sort of the Scylla and Charybdis of a number of issues. Calvinists in particular, now, most most groups within Christianity are sort of at different points between the Scylla and Charybdis. They're trying to hold the tension, but it's broad enough that they can sort of, they sort of favor to this side or favor to that side. I should pull up that Carlos Erie quote that I found recently in Reformations. Part of the frustration with how I manage a number of these books, which I do is often sort of back and forth between the, the Kindle version and the Audible version, is sometimes you hear something in the Audible version, it's like, ooh, I gotta remember that. What's nice is if you're in the Kindle version, you can just sort of highlight it. So often I hear something and I remember, okay, I have to, I have to pull up that book and mark that in the Kindle version because I'm gonna wanna go back to it and I can find it more reliably in the Kindle version. And this was actually on Zwingli and Predestination. If Zwingli retains any sense of paradox in his theology, it is in his conception of divine providence. Convinced as he was that human effort played a role in redemption, Zwingli also believed that God ultimately controlled everything, including who would be the faithful. Although he never dwelt on predestination or elaborated on the concept systematically, Zwingli spoke of election and sometimes even the term predestination, as when he said, predestination is born of providence, nay, is providence. Far from fatalistic, far from a fatalist, Zwingli believed in predestination that turned the elect into energetic agents of divine will. The fact that God chose his own did not mean that one had no choice. In fact, it was precisely because the divine act of choosing was a mystery that one was commanded to be active, for predestination was not about one's merit, but about God's displaying his power and mercy through human agency. I think that's a great quote. Now, part of the problem when I use a word like predestination or election is that people sort of trip on to sort of low-resolution, facile understandings or assumptions about how certain groups, particularly Calvinists, which is sort of nice to use a Zwinglian quote, because a lot of people don't know who Zwingli is, but Calvinists and predestination and fatalism and all of these things. The point that Erie was making with respect to Zwingli was... getting away from, let's say, substance ontology, which 
John and Jordan mention a number of times in this video. Well, what, what, do we, what do we mean when we're talking about substance ontology? And a lot of this came down to the use of the word real. And yeah, I could have just sat there and maybe it would have been better if I had just not pointed out. See, the difficulty of equivocation is when you're sitting and listening to a conversation and answering questions using the terms that the other people is, are using, even though you are fully conscious of the fact that you don't buy into the terms they are using in the way they are using, it puts you in a bind. Now, Jordan Peterson has, dis, dis, has, has shown this by numerous times when it comes to answering the question, do you believe in God? <sighs> I don't know that you and I agree with respect to what we mean by God, and I don't know that you and I believe the same with what we mean by the word believe. Now, people hear him and say, well, he's, a, he's, being, he's being obnoxious for not sort of going along. But then if he sort of begins to contest those words, well, then he's being obnoxious for being contestant. And so you also have to understand that when I approach a variety of different conversations, probably at the top of my hierarchy because relationship is so high on my hierarchy, I will modulate what I engage in the moment and what I don't based on sort of my estimation of how to further the relationship. So sometimes I'll listen and, and just people will, I, I won't, and again, I regularly hear from a number of you about, well, you just, you didn't, you should have you should have addressed every single thing. Right, Mark? A certain Mark out there? And a certain Manuel? You should have stopped at every single thing. Well, that doesn't make for a very good conversation, and it probably doesn't make for a good relationship. At the same time, you have to sort of figure out, okay, what to do. Now, with this particular conversation, he had initiated it, and he had wanted it for his channel, and so... He was sort of sitting in the driver's seat, and I was the one answering the questions. And so the conversation kind of folded the way it did. The next time we do it, we're going to do it the other way around. Part of what is true in this, though, is true that things have changed quite a bit. And I noticed in Brendan's comments, someone's like, oh, you should talk to Peugeot. And I thought... If you thought I was difficult to understand, wait for Jonathan. <laughs> and that doesn't mean that Jonathan is obtuse. It's that Jonathan, I, I feel sorry for Jonathan because, again, I looked at the conversation I had with him over four years ago, and part of what I thought was I, have so, I was so obtuse. I understand now a lot better of what Jonathan is saying because Jonathan is being saying the same thing over and over and over again all the way along. And I think progressing in it and getting better at it. And a lot of it was in this conversation that he had with Justin Brierley. And I'm sorry, I forget the name of the woman that Justin does these shows with. Uh, Belle Tyndall. And, and she made some excellent points in there. But, um, well, let's play a little. You, you, you call your channel the symbolic world in a nutshell what, what does that mean and what's different about the symbolic world compared to what my, most people might think is the real world you know of physics biology material stuff and so on well the idea of the symbolic world is now did you notice what Brust what justin just said that is the assumptive use of real and it's a naturalistic use of the word and so part of the reason I got a little combative on that word was, well, let's talk about it. Is really there are two ways that, that it, it, it's meant is one is I'm going to help people understand the world of symbolism. That is the way in which meaning comes together and manifests in patterns. And even when Jonathan says it that way, the world of symbolism, anybody who's sort of in a naturalistic worldview will hear that as, oh, there's the real world over here, basically substance ontology, and then there's metaphor. And so just go back and listen how often metaphor comes around. Jonathan's not really talking because metaphor then is defined as that which isn't real. 
And, and right there you have the laying out of the worldview in people's internal maps. But it also means symbolic world in the sense that we do live in a symbolic world. And I'm trying to help people see how meaning is actually inevitable, that you cannot escape it, actually. Um, and using phenomenology and St. Maximus the Confessor and many of the saints that would talk about reality as coming together through the logos and trying to show people that it's not, we're not, it's not just like some, th some arbitrary thing you have. Now, at this point, many, many people are simply lost. They're simply lost. They don't know what Jonathan is talking about. He, he's used some, and, and this isn't a critique of Jonathan. I mean, this is tremendously hard to talk about and to explain. And when you're in the midst of a conversation, it's really hard to get into, especially if, as that comment that I just read, if someone has, well, an idea. Well, do you want to know what Jonathan Peugeot thinks? He's going to talk like this. And it might take you a while to figure out what on earth he means by all of this. You have to believe in. But the way that especially the Christian mystics describe reality is, is an accurate description of how the world comes together. Now, even when he says the Christian mystics, people are going to be thinking in their head the chronological snobbery is going to be going. They're going to say, oh, yeah, that's, that's like the pre-modern people. And by definition, anything pre-modern is suspect and probably wrong because they didn't understand the real world. And that's just a worldview talking. That's just naturalism talking. Uh, and so helping people understand that and seeing that your experience of the world has a pattern and you, you, you just have to be able to get back into your experience. And the problem with scientific thinking is that scientific thinking is very useful for, you know, making planes fly and understanding the trajectory of a projectile or whatever, that kind of stuff. But um, it's actually secondary. It's a form of abstraction. We don't live in that world. We live in a world of experience and scient scientific descriptions are, are abstractions from that experience. And they're abstractions that can be accurate to their application, but nobody drinks H2O. That's ridiculous. Like you, you drink water and your experience of water is cold and wet, you know, and refreshing. These are the experiences that we live in. And if we can get back into those experiences, then everything in religion is available to us again. Even the descriptions that are the most strange to most people, which is the firmament in the sky and the the, the, the idea of these lights up in the heavens representing principalities or angels, all of this stuff that, that Christians for about 200 years have tried to shove into the corner and to, to avoid, that's actually great, amazing things. And, and that's what, that's, those are the kinds of things that we're helping people understand again. It's like, how can we re-engage with these? Now, if you've heard any Jonathan Peugeot, you've heard him give this speech. And Jonathan's done a ton of interviews. And once you, you begin to notice that, it is the same speech. He is trying to make the same point. Almost every interview. And you say, well, why would he have to try to make the same point almost every interview? And poor Jonathan's got to be tremendously patient. But the fact is that people don't get it. Why don't they get it? They don't get it for actually for reasons that if you understand what he says here, you can actually understand why people don't get it. They don't get it because you have to see the world from a place within the world. And that's when he goes back to, for a while, with Rationality Rules and Adam Frandled, Frandled, he would use, well, it depends where you're standing. And someone might have said in a naturalist way, but it would have been pedantic. Well, no, I'm sitting. No, 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 that's not That's not what I mean from it depends where you're standing. You view, you view the world through a map. And you received a map and inherited a map. And then when you went to education and, and learned that adopting other maps can actually help you gain status and all of the kinds of things you want, you really go after that map because, well, that map gave you status before the eyes of your professors. And your professors told you, if you keep working this map out there in the business world or in academia, that map will give you status before those people. 
And so it's this giant status game that keeps going. And actually, this after-school video does quite a good job of, of explaining how this works. And then it's interesting because he says, okay, once now you see that your filters are motivated, how can you get beyond it? And then he wants to say things, well, curiosity and humility. And then he rightly notes that, well, <laughs> curiosity and humility can be subject to exactly the same games that make us stupid and make us better master debaters, as he says, make, make us better rationalists in a certain frame of using that word rationalist than others. These, these types of images. Yeah. Can you, um, you mention patterns a lot and we use it in your bio. Can you talk, just break that open for me a tiny bit. What do you mean by, um, patterns of symbolism and what's an example perhaps of like maybe now again this question people are going to respond to this question in different ways but what this question actually shows is well you've known the word pattern since you were what seven or eight years old why don't you understand the word pattern oh well maybe jonathan's using the word not he's, he's using the word as sort of a a lens through which to see the world now this is sort of a this is sort of a a rhetorical difference between Jonathan Peugeot and John Verveke. John Verveke might have found a different Latin cognate for pattern and used that in order to distinguish it from the common use of the word pattern. Jonathan Peugeot just tends to use the word pattern. Now, either way you you go with this, John Verveke is then sort of critiqued or sometimes criticized for his use of language because he's using a different term to highlight a different nuance within the term. And then, oh, it's, but within this little corner, at least, fancy Verveke words is actually a, a, a term of endearment because we, we feel grateful for what John has done with this language. And to the degree that we can sort of figure out how to use it and use it between each other we find gold there. And of course, the John will be using this many and will only sort of capture this many and then maybe only this many will be of use between us, but it will slowly grow. And that's basically what's been happening. And that's what relationship does. And that's what community does. But of course, that's the downside for the, the strategy the linguistic, the, the rhetorical strategy that John Verveke uses. The downside for Jonathan Peugeot's word is people listen to him and they think, I know all the words that he said, but I'm not exactly sure why he said it. And that's her question here. Maybe one of the most pervasive symbolic patterns you see. So the, the, the idea of pattern is very important at the, at the basis of perception, which is okay. that... And this is one of the approaches that Jordan Peterson has helped me use as well, which is the cognitive science tack that I didn't have so much in the past. And we would put in the word combinatorial explosiveness here, because that's what Jonathan is referring to. Um, but the problem, the problem with perception when you engage with the world is that the world is full of stuff. The world is actually full of millions and millions and an indefinite amount of detail at every level. Sure. And, it, and so if I tried to describe something and I tried to describe every aspect of it, I could write a book that's, you know, the, the, the thickness of the earth, right? There is no limit to the amount of description that, is, that we can do. But the human person has the capacity to perceive unity through that. And so... You, you perceive the unity of something, whether it's a cup, a chair, a person, and that unity then is, constitutes a multiplicity that is organized. So the, the person has a pattern, right? There are things that make me recognize that I'm looking at a person and not at an elephant or sure. not at a car, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the pattern of the person. Yeah. Uh, and so, and it's fractal. So it's like every part of everything has that structure. So a person has a pattern I know what a face looks like. I recognize it. And then I can see the parts of the face and those parts of the face also have parts. And then et cetera, et cetera. You can keep going all the way down to the quantum field or whatever. Mm. But that is what I mean by patterns. And so it's actually not at all opposed in any way to 
to scientific thinking. It's yeah. actually it's very reasonable. It's it's quite reasonable. It's just that it's taking the the um, uh, perspective of experience first rather than this kind of abstract uh, this abstract perspective. And another thing important and, and part of what makes people in a naturalist worldview your your real worldview your functional worldview the worldview that is governing you is implicit to a great degree and you don't see it because it's the frame you are looking at the world through and so part of what we do is try to examine this now where was i going with that important to note it's the the um uh, perspective of experience first rather than this kind of abstract okay yeah so if you if you watch my conversation with brandon i talk i contrast the monarchical vision with the perspective of experience because really and if you go to the the jordan hall conversation question then is this other disposition like the first person disposition and what it means to be in a culture where the third person has been so pervasive in the way that we are in relationship with reality that we have become obligate third person and in fact so obligate that we simulate first person through the third person. And this is how Can you say a little bit more about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm going to delve into that. Okay. Notice, of course, I'm, I'm making this all up in real time, but, but you know, this is what I do. This is, what... this is exactly the same point. This is the same point Jonathan Peugeot makes. This is the same point I make when I talk about a monarchical vision and the first person perspective. Now, Jordan Hall is making the third person perspective versus the third, first person perspective. These are all ways of trying to get at this shift. People within a naturalist worldview don't see their approach, their monarchical vision approach, their third-person approach to the world as an abstraction. They don't see it as an abstraction. It's because it's their functional operating system. So, and that's the way everyone's religion is. It's the way everyone's worldview is. You, you have to begin somewhere, and it's sort of like having a computer that has no operating system. Well, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to make productive use of the computer without an operating system, but every operating system is going to entail limitations and are going to have consequences. So and again, these are sort of the basic points of what's been happening. and and how, to a degree, this little corner has arisen is, is that. Well, maybe that's enough for now. Um, I really do want to spend, and, and again, now Brandon made a response video to our video, and I guess this is sort of the same thing. I haven't watched his yet. Um, but I think it's important that one of the things that you learn pastorally is that you need different kinds of modes and the different kinds of modes are appropriate for different kinds of situations sometimes pastors can be very gentle and therapeutic let's say non-judgmental continual listening yada 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 that has great value especially in terms of dealing with people with trauma and anxiety they're so easily triggered, they, they, they fly from the relationship. And so one of the things that you do in order to be able to continue playing the game, as Jordan Peterson says, is that you enter into a therapeutic pastoral mode so you don't scare the person off. But there are moments when, if in fact the relationship is solid enough, you can begin to have a little bit more rough and tumble play. Because there's value with that. And relationships can actually be strengthened by that because it's like wow they pinned me kind of hard but we're still friends wow when we were sparring you hit kind of hard but we're still friends because i you know i i want if if the rough and tumble play is working i want us to both discover limits but now that's dangerous business because 
You don't really know what the limits of the other person are, often until they've been violated, and then you need a reparative conversation. And, and this is a key element to, let's say, marriage. If you, you read almost any contemporary marriage, good marriage book, they will say the key to a marriage is not whether or not you avoid fights. It's how are your reparative conversations? And can you do that? And which leads to Walter Wangerin's book, uh, Me and My House. I don't think it's in print anymore. It's one that I read uh, before I was married, where he basically said, the key to marriage is two things. Don't leave and learn to forgive. <laughs> and if you think that through, it's like often people don't get to learn to forgive because they leave and they don't have to forgive. And I mentioned that in the sermon on Sunday because the disciples get all excited about the withered tree and Jesus is talking about faith and they get all excited about, oh, faith, what, what if I can, what if God is a divine genie that I can ask what I want and, and he will give me everything but asking? Oh, yeah, and then there's that forgiveness thing. If, if you don't do forgiveness, God's not going to listen to anything you say. What? What, what? what kind of relationship is that? So... Um, Anyway, yeah, maybe that's enough for now. Um, I, I do want to spend more time on naturalism, and I do want to bring in uh, Carlos Erie's book, The History of the Impossible, because that, that definitely impinges on whole ranges of things. Another thing that I, another book that I'm reading um, is, oh, I always put the, Another book that I'm reading is uh, Richie Robertson's The Enlightenment, um, 1680 to 1790. As you know, Father Father Eric was making an important point in his little um, monologue at the beginning of his live stream, in that these words are rough approximation of a whole bunch of things, and if you actually read history on the Enlightenment, it's a far stranger world than the ones that uh, that we're inhabiting. But oh, let me pull up um, this little thing that I that I noted on Newton. Natural philosophy sort of leads to naturalism, but that's why I call it the naturalistic lab leak or the scientistic lab leak. Because that which is appropriate in some contexts is not appropriate in others. The claims of natural philosophy are thus relatively modest. Philosophers do not profess to reveal the ultimate nature of things. And, and when you say things like, levitation doesn't happen, you're just being a hypocrite. Because at any rules of evidence, you should say the preponderance of evidence is that levitation happens. I think, I think Hume's claim about extraordinary evidence for extraordinary claims doesn't really hold up because what exactly are categories of evidence? There are categories, but people don't work that way. If, in fact, you, let's say you were a servant in, um, in a particular household in the 14th century of, let's say, someone who was uh, an exceptional saint and you open the door to bring in their dry crust of bread for their ascetic meal and you discover them four feet above the ground glowing, <laughs> that's all the extraordinary evidence that you need. <laughs> but then Erie is a, is a very fair analysis in this because he says, that why do these things sort of pick up and, and in fact, levitation before a certain point in the church was evidence of demonic work and later was evidence of the other. But then the Protestants picked up the assertion that it's demonic. It's a fascinating, it's a fascinating case study of the fallacies and hypocrisies of a naturalistic worldview. So the claims of natural philosophy are thus relatively modest. Philosophers do not profess to reveal the ultimate nature of things. They willingly leave such inquiries to the theologians. This is, of course, Newton and his contemporaries. 
but within the domain of natural philosophy, they are agreed, there are agreed criteria of truth. Not absolute truth, but truth good enough for all practical purposes. And this is sort of pragmatism before pragmatism, which are much firmer than any criteria theologians can find. Disputes about matters of fact can, evident, um, can eventually be resolved, maybe or maybe not, through experiment. No, you can only you can only resolve replicatable questions through experiment, but there's no replication most of human history. This is exactly, again, a point that C.S. Lewis makes in his book, Miracles. Whereas disputes about theology drag on for centuries and centuries and are generally settled by dogmatic authority or by force um, or, forget, or forgotten when everybody has lost interest. Precisely because its claims are modest but feasible, natural science becomes the model for all knowledge. And right there is the problem. When it becomes the model for all knowledge, suddenly the limitations that were recognized by those who came up with it are abandoned and forgotten, and now everything is subject to the limitations of natural philosophy. And that then becomes the naturalistic lab leak or naturalism. So... That's enough for this video. Uh, leave, a, leave a comment. Hope it was helpful.